Brandon, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Angela. Great to be here with you. Yes, yes. I'm so excited. Uh, we were just talking uh, before we clicked to record. Um, I got uh, turned on to your work um, by reading a Forbes article where you were talking all about purpose. And I think what really struck me uh, in that conversation is kind of that connection to the workplace and to organizations, people who have platforms, right? Uh, whether that's a workplace, whether that's a community or a movement. Um, so tell us a little bit more about you, uh, what you do, what your work is, and um, what's the impact you're looking to make on the world? Yeah. Uh, well, like you, Midwesterner, grew up in <laughs> Illinois. Um, and there wasn't, at least in the 80s, 90s, any purpose conversation happening, at least not around me. Um, mm. It was just go to work or, well, first, you know, go to college, marry your college sweetheart, move her out to the burbs, make some more humans, <laughs> become principal of whatever professional services thing you're a part of, and then die on a golf course. And that was kind of it. And um, <laughs> I have like an image it, in my head of dying yeah. on the golf yeah, course. Just, <laughs> and if that wasn't enough for you, you had the Chicago Bears or the Catholic Church to turn to. And like, mm. and, but for me, I was like, there's got to be more than this. This is, it's not bad, but where's the aliveness? Like, why isn't anyone up to anything? Um, so that purpose question was there, but I didn't have even have words to it until my late twenties when I began to pull the threads and over the next say seven years, discovered the whole body of purpose work and, you know, experienced it myself as a participant, got trained and certified in it. And um, I mean, I regard it as a civil right that mm. without this awareness, without understanding who we really are, we're at the effect of just society, family issues, uh, in some case, childhood trauma. We're, we're literally not ourselves. We're, we're at the effect of these issues. And when we get, at least when I get connected to it, I get to be actually be myself. And that's what the United States of America is about being fully mm. self-expressed have the rights to ensure that uh, occurs. So that's what I've been doing for the last decade is writing books and talking about it and leading programs and trying to get more people to get trained and certified in and bring it to their companies and schools and churches and just <laughs> all the things. All the carnival things. barking for purpose, basically. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I think you're, I mean, it's always, it's always been the time for this work, but um before I get into my question, sorry, I did not hear your, uh, well, maybe this is the, the impact you're looking to make on the world, uh, but any any other thoughts about that impact? Well, I mean, if we had a base layer of purpose, 98% of our problems would go away. Um, mm. Because when we get enchanted with who we really are, you know, and what our life is about, we inherently recognize the dignity of other people and they also have that, especially if they're already awake, if they're already. So it, a lot of the deep divisions, a lot of the things that are keeping, you know, known best practices and policies from getting implemented in the United States and other places you know, basically boils down to, we don't know each other and we don't trust the other ones. I mm -hmm. mean, I should say we, we don't know ourselves and we don't trust anyone else. And so, if we or we can, think we're right all the time. Right? Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, there's a lot of righteousness, but that righteousness is a defense mechanism, of like not actually knowing who we are and being oh, deeply wounded and unhealed. Because um, a, a a person who's uh, who has done some purpose work is a lot more uh, comfortable in ambiguity, and, and mm. it doesn't get solidified so much into righteousness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the work that you're doing is, is so needed on so many fronts. And, you know, I kind of work in the sphere of the workplace, but, you know, we were just talking earlier about the ripple effect of businesses. And I, I kind of, you know, what you, what came to mind was I recently went on a trip to Europe. Um, I mean, Europe, Europe, Italy, the, the region I was in has its own issues. Um, but one of the things I asked, I, I was just very curious. I asked everybody I came in contact with, like people at the bar, you know, or the, at a restaurant or a beach. What do you think about when you think about the U.S.? 
Do you want to hear my answers? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here were the answers that I got. And I'm just bringing, this was totally unplanned, by the way, which is why I'm struggling to find it. So That's we're perfect. going to find it. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I came in contact with people who are, who were from Italy, who were from other countries like uh, Romania and just all over the, all over the world, really. And here are some of the things that they said. Um, the one that struck me the most was a country without a culture. Um, let's see what we, they mentioned cowboys, hamburgers, a lot of service level stuff. <laughs> I mean, like things that, you know, kind of just, or an, another interesting one was, um, you know, they basically said surface level, right? Like mm. everyone in the U S is, um, is kind of surface level and, and artificial. Um, but that, that one piece, that one piece, a culture, a country without a culture, and to me, that signifies that we have a purpose issue as a, as a country. Yeah. I mean, we have some individuals within, within this country who live within this country, I think, who have been marginalized and maybe have been forced to think more about their purpose within this country, mm -hmm. right? Which is a lot of people who are doing the purpose work, I think. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. What do you think about that? This was, this was so impromptu. I just, it came to mind as you were talking. It's perfect. Um, and I think that there's a lot of truth in that. Um, what passes for a culture um, are essentially coping mechanisms from generations of trauma. Um, mm. Now, that being said, we've actually developed beautiful culture from this trauma. So jazz, blues, um, you know, and, and, and not that there's not something very sweet and pastoral about, you know, a county fair. Like I've been to many, you know, there's a lot that I'm like not down with, like <laughs> the monster truck rally and like all that. But, <laughs> but, you know, like the crafts and, you know, the, the caring for the, the animals and, and the livestock. And um, so it's, th there's stuff there, right? There, there actually is stuff here. It's just what, the, the main narrative around our culture, it's like wealth, and beauty, and fame. And it's, mm -hmm. as they said, you know, we are a, a young, juvenile, surface level culture that cares about what we look like, basically, as opposed to who we are. Well, that's a good uh, point. I, it, it is, if you look at like the United States compared to like a Rome where I was at, or an Athens, like these are ancient cultures that had time to develop. And so when I think about like the organization, there's like maturity levels that we typically look at, mm -hmm. right? And that helps us kind of diagnose and define the culture of the organization, but also where it can go, where it can transform to. Yeah. So what you bring up is a, is a good point. It sounds like we're, we're in early stages, but what, what pivotal point are we at right now? Because I, I kind of get the sense from our conversations, our limited conversations that you know, kind of this idea of the, the soul, or the purpose of the nation is at risk right now. What's, what's your gauge on that? Yeah. And organizations basically are on the front line of this and I'll, I'll swing around back to that in a second. Um, so as I understand it, you know, having read, you know, through the documents, basically the sacred text, the sacred text mm -hmm. of our nation, um, in addition to like 1619 Project, Indigenous People's History, People's History, that we're a very unique nation, like one of mm -hmm. two nations that are, are covenantal, meaning like not from an existing culture or mm -hmm. yeah. uh, ethnicity or, or religion. But like we, we said, actually, we're about these ideas. And if you're down with that, you're going to do great here. If you're not down with that, keep moving. Like, it's, and, and it's basically, you know, the, as Lincoln said, the central tenet of our ancient faith is all created equal. You know, Kennedy said the same thing. This is, this is the thing. If you're, if you're not down with that, everything you're going to experience here is going to piss you off because everything that we're trying to get done here is that. 
Hmm. And then our two animating aspirations of that are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and institutions that ensure that. And then e pluribus unum, which on its surface is basically like from many one. It's like, yay, you know, like a Benetton ad or by the world of Coke ad. <laughs> gotcha. But like the, the deeper spiritual philosophical source of that is from Cicero and Pythagoras and it's um, unum fiat ex pluribus, which means we achieve unity when we love another as much as, as, as ourselves. So mm -hmm. it's much closer to King's uh, beloved community, right? And so this is who we say we are. This is, this is what is at stake. And I don't know about you, but I haven't experienced any of those things ever in my entire life here in the United States. Like, Same not, days. yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's probably much more severe in your case, right? Hmm. Now I've had moments like, uh, festivals in Oakland, you know, certain times at the YMCA, I'm like, yes, this is America. But for the most part, especially a place like San Diego and Chicago too, deeply segregated, you know, diverse, but I mean, what is diverse if you don't talk to one another? Like it's mm -hmm. not, it's not a thing. So we're at this, we're at this place of like a, a deep lack of integrity with what it means to live in a, a multicultural liberal democracy. And then what we actually experience, which is a racist class, classist apartheid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think that's really what's, what's happening right now is like a bunch of folks are, are stepping up and saying, I want to protect this. I want to live in that world. And a bunch of folks are saying, make America white again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these or are the people. The most who are yeah. sitting next to each other in their cubicles, who are investing oh. in our, your company, who are buying your products. And so, yeah, there's a lot that businesses are experiencing. Well, yeah, I mean, what, what you're talking about are two different layers to this. I mean, you're talking about uh, the, the system, right? I mean, if we think about the nation as, as a system and grounded in values, and, and I, I talk about culture within workplaces the same exact way. It's like, are our words matching our actions. That's how culture is, literally. And that's how culture manifests itself within a society. Yeah. And culture is a culmination of intent, but it's also a groundswell. It's also happens organically. And so I think what you're saying is, if I were thinking about this from an organizational perspective, our culture is actually not what we say it is right now. And how do we, in, in an intentional way, make sure it becomes what it originally was founded on? Yeah. Um, so how, how does one, from an organizational perspective or a nation's perspective, how does one do that? Like, how, how do we create this change? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, there's just in the New York Times today, a great article about how close are we to a civil war? Right. So we did like get the urgency of this. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, it's not going to be like it was in the 1860s. It's going to be sporadic, extremely violent, high casualty events uh, with but without a battle line and uh, without a coordinated thing. Mm -hmm. So. And what's also at risk is not just uh, political violence but actually democracy itself, right? So all of these anti-democratic political entrepreneurs, I'll just call them that, um, they're just exploiting hate and racist dog whistles to stay in power and all that. They are uh, destroying the democracy upon which capitalism depends. Because without it, it mm -hmm. every enterprise becomes a puppet of the, you know, the demagogue in power. And that severely limits organizational autonomy, severely limits civil rights, especially for women, people of color, uh, from the LGBTQIA plus communities. So, and, and also like, you know, generally half of our employees and customers now are living in a, uh, a fear-based autocracy, like think like Gilead from Handmaid's Tale. Right? Mm. Mm. So, that's that, that's what's at stake. I mean, we've already seen it. Margaret Atwood told us this is exactly what happens. Like a the theocratic autocracy comes in and just 
lays waste to women. Um, and most of the men too, for that matter. Um, so it, it's all hands on deck across sectors. We all need to recognize what's happening. Um, now, unfortunately, the sectors that historically we might have turned to, like the government or education or religion or journalism, they've been on a multi-decade long slide, mm. right? Trust in government's down from 77% to less than a quarter now. Whereas the private sector, I think it's something like 70% of us trust our employer, 94% of us trust our, our mm -hmm. um, uh, small businesses, which, which is where like half of us work. And that's where we spend our time, you know, as you know, being like an organization geek, like this is 2000 hours of people's attention that you have when they're probably spending anywhere from 50 to 200 hours a year doing anything else. Like hmm. if you're not going to impact beliefs and behaviors in organizations, we, we don't stand a chance. Like we have to activate hmm. uh, empathy, trust, uh, inclusion, um, critical thinking skills, purpose, all these things here in order, because that, that's this is our, our sandbox, our, our fertile garden to develop these very humanistic qualities so that we come back home to our partner and our families, and our communities. And, you know, we're not on some kind of racist hyperbole rant. We're actually just being ourselves. Yeah. And you, um, you bring up something that I, I don't know if, if you are familiar with the Edelman trust barometer mm -hmm. and maybe that's where you uh, got your, um, your stats, but I am a huge, like I, I track that thing because I know just recently, like this past year, that that or the past few years that shift happened um probably during covid right because there were so many different sources of information and people were confused and during covid i was working within industry as a chro who had to be that person who was the source of truth and i will say it was very exhausting <laughs> so how do we like how do we start to build sustainability with that responsibility because you don't learn that in business school you don't learn that in uh higher education you don't you don't start a business and know how to have that type of responsibility i know it's a mindset but how you do and how you actually play it out i mean do you have any ideas <laughs> can we can we change the world in this podcast i don't know mm -hmm. i know i'm asking yeah. some tough questions no i mean it, it, i I don't have all the answers, of course, but mm -hmm. um, so I'll just, let me just share some stuff from personal experience. Um, yes. Like I said, I grew up without purpose and I tried to put everything I possibly could into that purpose-sized hole in my heart. Mm -hmm. I tried to put in, you know, a desire to be successful, drugs, mm -hmm. <laughs> random sexual encounters, travel, just like fill this fill this hole in my, in my heart. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes what, what can get in there, especially if you're a consumer of a lot of this irresponsible media are conspiracy theories, uh, like doubt in science, anti-intellectual behaviors and, and attitudes. And especially if that's all you're surrounded by, um, that's, that's essentially what you are feeling. And, and because it's not, inherently nourishing, you have to keep consuming it. It's like mm -hmm. a hungry ghost. Now, when we activate purpose, it's, it's reversing the flow. So instead of like going out for chemicals and conspiracy theories and outrage porn and all this kind of stuff, it's actually about kind of giving who we are. Um, and in a sense, and you know, research shows this, you can check it out at scienceofpurpose.org, like just about every pro social attribute that what we would define as like part of a whole human adult is correlated with a sense of purpose. Hmm. Similarly with positive outcomes in health and career and relationships. So if we can activate purpose at scale, which is the question I've been in for the last three years, like we should do it because it's, it's essentially an effective defense against a uh, antisocial behaviors, but for like nonsensical identities and, you know, extremist groups becoming this thing that we have to keep ingesting in order mm. to like have any sense of coherence with the world. Whereas like purpose comes online, lets us know who we are in relationship to the world and what's, what's ours to do about it. 
Yeah. And, and from an organizational perspective, you know, I mean, just some things I can think about, you know, I'm, I'm a business owner, right? I'm a new business owner. So, you know, I'm starting to think even, I don't have any employees, but I'm starting to think now, like, what is the purpose of this organization? What, what impact is it going to make on the world? And, and how do I translate that into hiring people who are going to contribute to that purpose and feel good about it? (laughs) You know, because that's the other thing is when you have purpose, you can also be uh, a lot more narrow around um, and, and clear about what you're trying to achieve. And you can oh, yeah. give people the choice, the option, the clearer you are with that, you give them a choice. So I think that is one way that we can, you know, we can solve this, right? Is, you know, for those of you who are listening and who are business owners, founders, entrepreneurs, anyone who has a platform where you're impacting other human beings, you have an opportunity, I think, to to understand what your purpose is as an organization, as a founder, and then as an organization, and then that ripple effect and what what that actually looks like, what that is operationalized like into your decision making, your process, even procedures. Like it, it has to like the heartbeat has to live and breathe in everything. Absolutely. Um, and that's kind of. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working on writing a book. I know you've already written a book, so we'll have to talk about that later. (laughs) Um, but I'm working on, um, uh, so it's, it's a book about how businesses can be a catalyst for social change. And it's based on this premise of the ripple effect where at the middle is you right business owner and getting really clear about that and then rippling that out. Um, and so I think that is, that is the goal. And I know that sounds, it's, it's, it's a big meta task, but it's almost something that has, has to constantly be a part of the way you build your business and strategy. Cause you're, to your point, mm-hmm. we have a platform and we have to use it. So. You got to talk to my wife that like, she is like, <laughs> business is the change the world needs. This is how it's done. It ripples <laughs> out. Like, like yes. oh, <laughs> I love it. I would love to talk to her. That would be yeah. awesome. Um, so one quick thing I just want to add to this, because I think this is where a lot of folks are at, at least here on the West Coast. I don't know about Chicago. Mm-hmm. By the way, can you hear that? That plumbing next door? Yes, it's okay. We just have a little background noise. It's all good. So it's serenading us. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I had no idea. I, th- I thought they were done this morning and they're just like, they're taken to like level 10 now. Um, That's okay. So where a, a lot of folks... Uh, have have done some kind of organizational purpose work. Um, nine times out of ten, it's just a bunch of MBAs in a room saying, mm. you know, it's basically what are the SWOT. words? Yeah, yeah. Well, the SWOT analysis. You know, customer yeah. excellence, going the extra mile. Okay, done. Who's got cocktails? You know, and it's just. <laughs> <laughs> um, now there there are beautiful as you as you know like beautiful visions that are deeply humanistic. Like they're out to impact something you could point to on the UN sustainable, sustainable mm-hmm. development goals or like point to on Maslow's needs hierarchy. And they've got values that are actually like, they, they resonate with our con- wisdom and contemplative traditions. They're like, it's about care. It's about, you know, curiosity. It's about whatever, as opposed to like going the extra mile. You know, <laughs> <laughs> What does that even mean? <laughs> I know. It's ridiculous. So, even, even folks who have these, like, you know, really heartfelt purpose, uh, you know, mission, vision, values, it's still not going to resonate with employees, which, as you know, the number one stakeholder in every organization, until they themselves have discovered who they really are. Because mm. that is the only thing that allows them to genuinely connect with larger forms of meaning, such as the organization's mission and values, or the purpose of our nation and all that kind of stuff. So we have to basically build this bridge between the uh, enlightened business leader and then the purpose activated employee. And that's, that's mm-hmm. how an organization becomes fully embodied in their purpose. Um, Cause everyone's got their unique connection to the vision and values and they need, need the opportunity to discover that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point because a lot of times these exercises can be top down and it's like the executives are in the room defining the purpose and so like enrollment i think in the process is really important and again also i i I can't 
like underline this enough, but like the transparency with your, the transparency and the kind of crowdsourcing part of that process and allowing people to opt out. I know this is like a very uncomfortable subject for organizations because like loyalty is so baked into our traditional kind of industrial revolution based model of work. And it's like, I'm the employee or the worker. So you have to be aligned to my purpose. And that's it to your point, you know, kind of how we develop some of those principles early on where in reality, it should be a partnership. You know, you're coming to work for me and contribute to my purpose. And hopefully this experience is contributing to your purpose. And that is the ultimate marriage. Um, but, you know, I don't, do you think purpose changes? Yes, purpose changes. I'm sorry, these guys are going nuts next door. Um, yeah, it, it, it does change. Um, there, are, there are aspects that are kind of immutable, like our, our core essence and our virtues, but the, our expression, especially like as the world changes, like the expression of our purpose will, will, will shift. It doesn't mean like one day you're, you know, in sales and the next day you're digging ditches. You know, it's, mm. it, it's actually that you're, you're seeing a deeper expression of, of who you are and you need to mm. express that. You, know, you might think of like how an actor goes from actor to director to yes. producer to, you know, maybe writer, writer, producer, that kind of thing. Mm, um, I love that. Yeah. The, the expression of your purpose ebbs and flows yeah. with, with how you learn more about yourself and the same thing with an organization. I think, I think I read somewhere where someone said like core values don't change. And I was just like, the thing that woke me up to this was like, COVID, we've just been through a pandemic. Uh, our democracy, democracy is under attack. Our economy is struggling. Like all, like these things have to, to change perspective. And I think the other thing I would just mention to the listeners is if you do have core values, first of all, if you don't have behaviors aligned to those core values, get them um, and they can change over time because your organization will change over time too and evolve. I, I totally agree. Um, and that, uh, we haven't talked much about the, the work that I, that we do at unity lab, but, um, and it, it's basically to hold space for that is mm. to, uh, empower people to discover who they are, bring that to work and talk about it with their peers. So all, all of our programs are designed for that because every day, every month, every year, that person is showing up newly, the world is showing up newly. And so we mm. have to keep pulling those threads, like, who are we in this moment? What, are, what is there to do now? And then unpacking our experience and having, having it integrated into our awareness, and our relationships, and our, our communication. Um, I just wish we, there was, uh, there were like 500, 500 unity labs. Um, mm -hmm. because I, I do have a lot of fear. I'm not gonna lie. Like, I don't know if the Republic's gonna, if we're going to get there in time by November, 2024, like I, I, I want to, I, I want to make a bunch of noise. I want McKinsey and EY and everybody to steal our work and, and, and go take it. Mm -hmm. But I, I have fear. I, I have a lot of fear around that. Um, well, thank yeah. you for sharing that. Cause I think a lot of people are probably listening to this and share similar fears. So I think being open and vulnerable about that is important. And it's also part of this, this healing journey that we're trying to go on. And, and I might be a little bit more optimistic than you are. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like there's movement around this. I feel like I'm also fearful. I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah. And I also have, I'm sensing a strong focus on accountability, especially for, for this new generation that is coming into the workplace, like Gen Zers, right, who are starting to contribute to society and are um, influencing just mm -hmm. all all sectors. So by 2024, I don't know, but um, I, I understand where your fear is coming from. <laughs> I totally, I totally get it. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that like last year I started writing my book. I'm like, like we, we need to get this out so that it's not relying on my company to, to do it all. Yeah. Um, 
So I really hope you folks can, can check out Purpose Work Nation. You can you can listen to it, watch it for free, um, because I mean, like some of the results, like the reason I give away for free, like I'm not trying to get rich out of it. Like I, I literally just want to fix this nation. So like the results are like 98% of folks experience respect from their diverse peers, 96% experience empathy, 94% uh, feel comfortable sharing their fears and anxiety. Um, and that's, that's just from what they, what they say about it. But mm. when, when people actually bring their purpose to work, it's you know, seven and a half months longer tenure, 175% more productive, nine and a half fewer days off. Like folks show up as their full self, you know, they're bringing their wild ideas, their dissenting opinions. Um, and so if you want that for them, uh, if you want an organization, like, please do this. Like steal this, <laughs> take it, run with it, make it your own. <laughs> like just hurry up, just just yeah. hurry up. Because <laughs> I, do it today. Do I am committed to living in a democracy where women can be safe on the street, and we need to do this like yesterday. So please. <laughs> yes. Well, I I I appreciate your um the, your speed as to which you know you're kind of putting into perspective the the priority around this. So yeah. Tell us where people can find you. I know you talked about the, the book. Um, tell tell people where they, they can find you and work with you or access these resources to get started. Sure. Uh, best place probably to go is just brandonpeel.com, B-R-A-N-D-O-N-P-E-E-L-E. -E -E. Uh, and there's you can find links to Unity Lab, which is our organization work, books, um, all that good stuff. Of course, LinkedIn is fine, too. Love it. Love it. Well, Brandon, I loved this conversation. Uh, you are just so um, purpose driven and so uh, passionate about this work. And it, it just makes it makes those other people who are doing the work feel like they have their people, you know, yeah. and uh, I think community for us is also very important for our healing because we're working on the hard shit. And it's hard. It's really hard sometimes to be in this alone or feel like, um, yeah you know, you don't have a community. So if you are also listening and maybe you are a change agent or a change maker or um, have a purpose driven movement that you're trying to move forward, um, Brandon would also be a great person to reach out to, to yeah. help move it you. around. It's going to, it right. literally has to take all of us. Like, like yeah. <laughs> plus times two. That's just like yeah, all the, all of, all the little infant human beings. We have to start <laughs> help, you know, getting them there too. You know, I was talking know, to my. <laughs> oh, go go ahead. ahead. I was talking to my husband. I was because we don't have kids yet, but we we want to have kids um, and a family one day. But I'm just like I'm gonna be talking like if I'm ever pregnant, I'm gonna be talking to my belly about this stuff because <laughs> we just we don't have any time. To your point, we don't have any yeah. time. Yeah, I know it's 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 go time. Um, you know what I was gonna share is like you know how when. A country like say ukraine is getting invaded and they make all these international appeals like yeah i kind of feel like we need to make an international appeal like hey everybody we, we literally can't fix this ourselves come on in. We, we need your experts we need like just like help us solve the white supremacy thing help us help us solve poverty mm -hmm. it's like i don't know what it's going to take like because we know what to do we just can't get it done and it's like, it's crazy. So Joe Biden, hire us. <laughs> we <laughs> yeah. want to help. <laughs> we do need a ministry of culture, like an actual, like, here's how we make e pluribus unum, life, labor, yes. life, labor, in the pursuit of happiness. Um, I mean, I think about that all the time. I'm always watching the news and I'm just like, culture issue, culture issue. That leader's <laughs> toxic. <laughs> like, <laughs> like yeah. I just, like, just hire me. I will, I will whip it into shape. Like, I know the it. formula. <laughs> I'll fix it. I'll fix it. But there's also s systemic things that are just like, like yeah. protected. And there's, it's not, it's, it's not that easy. So, yeah. so well, and Angela, I do need to ahead. run. I have to go meet one of my advisors, but this was a lot of fun. Yes. And thank you I, so much. It was great. It. And uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast, Brandon. You got it. Okay.